Hey everyone, welcome to Theory Lunch. We have Shamsan here to talk about memory bonds for the expert problem and again he says smart contract smart contract is for Okay, yeah, thanks for the, introdu the introduction and thanks everyone for showing up. Um, this is joint work with Fadehe Srinivas, uh, Neil Zhu, and David uh, Woodruff, I guess. Um, uh, in particular, I, I'd like to mention that uh, Vadehi did a great job in um, assembling these slides, and uh, there's some wonderful pictures and illustrations that uh, you know she spent a lot of time in. Um, but you know, I, I would also say that, uh, of course, I took the final pass over these slides. So if they're typos, then they weren't true by me. Um, okay, so yeah, today I'd like to talk about the memory bounds for the expert problem. Um, I'd like to talk about uh, you know, some of the challenges we faced and um, some interesting properties that we, we ran in along the way that kind of motivated us to study this problem. It's a new twist on a classical problem, but uh, it's also you know, the most hands-on I've ever been on reinforcement learning. So you know, if you see anything that uh, I may have missed, um, if you see you know, any relevant references or uh, alternate al algorithms, then you know, feel, feel free to chime in, okay? Yeah, so if I can get this to work. Um, okay. Yeah, so the prediction with expert advice, it's a well-studied problem. I'm sure many of you guys have seen it before, but it's a fund fundamental problem of sequential prediction. And in this problem, we have a number of experts and they're going to give advice on some particular problem. And we would like to utilize the advice of the experts to have um, a good success rate in terms of actually predicting whatever outcome we're trying to look for. So for example, you know, let's suppose that we have these following four experts and um, we're trying to predict the weather on each day, okay? So on day one, we might see that uh, four of the experts, three of them ex uh, expect the day to be sunny. All right, so then you as the algorithm can make some prediction. I personally would you know, say that it's probably going to be sunny and then look at the actual outcome, okay? So the actual outcome is that it is indeed sunny that day. We'll utilize that advice somehow, maybe, uh, the outcome somehow, and we'll look at the advice in the next day. So on day two, we have our four experts give advice again. Three of these people say it's going to be rainy. So you as the algorithm might say it's rainy. And if you do, you could be correct because uh, maybe it turns out that it actually is rainy on the second day. You know, on the third day, again, we see three experts that are uh, sunny. And so we're gonna think it's sunny perhaps, but now, now say that uh, it's rainy, so, so we're wrong, okay? Finally, on day four, we see that two of the experts think it's sunny and two think it's rainy. So what are we going to do? Well, maybe we could notice that uh, on day three, you know, the third expert thought it was going to be sunny and they were wrong. Um, so we might want to downweight the, the third expert and the first expert. And we might think that, you know, maybe the second expert is more accurate so far. So we'll pay more attention to the second expert and we think it's going to be rainy. And actually we're wrong in this case, but you know, this is an example of why you might use previous outcomes to um, judge the relevance of an, expertise, an expert's uh, accuracy level, okay? Yeah, so how do we quantify performance? You know, in general, predicting the future is impossible. We're not going to assume any kind of underlying distribution on the outcomes, right? So we're not going to say that you can just ignore the experts and you know, try to look at the uh, outcomes yourself and see some kind of pattern over the outcomes to allow you to, to actually predict the, uh, the future without listening to the experts at all. So we're going to judge our outcome or our, our algorithm based on what's known as regret. And regret is just the number of mistakes that the algorithm makes more than the best expert, okay? And I'll actually kind of abuse notation a bit by talking about average regret, which is just the regret divided by the total number of days. So in our previous example, you'll notice that uh, if we use the forecast that I mentioned in the first uh, slide, then we'll have been wrong on two days. And this seems bad because, you know, there have only been four days in total, but uh, actually all the experts have made mistakes so far, okay? So compared to like the best expert, we're still kind of okay because our algorithm has made two mistakes the best expert has made one, so we have one regret. And our average regret is one fourth, of course, okay, because we amortize over four days. Okay, so in summary, we have N experts who decide either zero or one on each of T days. Now this can be more general, you know, you can have 
more decisions on each day, so you can have uh, more penalties and so forth. But for, for now, we're just going to say that uh, we make a binary decision on each day. And this is on each of t days. And we're going to assume that n is much bigger than t. OK, so we have so many experts that uh, we can't really, I don't know, we're overwhelmed by the experts compared to the number of days there are. Oh, OK, so um, we don't need that assumption now. But I'm going to be talking about a model where we care about the space complexity of algorithms. And so in that um, sense, it'll make it, yeah, it's more reasonable to assume that um, you know, we can't store every expert. Yeah, so the algorithm will take advice from the experts and they'll predict either you know, zero or one in each day, whether it's rainy or sunny. The algorithm will see the outcome, which is again, either rainy or sunny, and uses information on future days. And the cost of the algorithm is number of incorrect predictions, but we'll measure the uh, total, um, I guess, uh, quality of the algorithm based on the average regret, which is the amortized additional cost of the algorithm compared to the cost M of the best expert. OK, so this is used in a lot of places. Um, one example is ensemble learning, where you have a bunch of models trained on the various data by machine learning algorithms. And they each have a lot of different hyperparameters. We don't know which one are, you know, which hyperparameters are the right ones. So we just look at all of them together. And we want to boost the success of all these um, algorithms by just saying, OK, I have all these different hyperparameters. I want to do one that, I want an algorithm that kind of does as good as uh, the, the best choice of models and hyperparameters. OK, so this is what Adaboost boost or adaptive boosting does. Um, in my first slide, you know, I mentioned, or actually many slides, I've been mentioning weather forecasts. But you can also imagine a situation where the experts are not talking about whether a day is sunny or uh, rainy, but um, they have some investments and they make some decisions on what to do with their investments. And uh, you, didn't get in, you, you get some feedback on each day about how the investments turn out. Um, and, and that'll give you some feedback on, uh, you know, how you should listen to the experts in the future days. All right, it's also a special case of online convex optimization where you have a number of convex functions on each day. So each function arrives with, um, each day arrives with a new convex function and you're seeking to minimize this uh, penalty, which is the uh, convex function evaluated on some like point in the in space that you choose. Okay, and in this case, the experts will um, give advice on what points in space for you to choose. OK, so what's known for this? Well, the classical algorithm is weighted majority. It's by Littlestone and Wormuth over 30 years ago. And it's uh, actually quite simple. So initially, we're going to initialize all the uh, experts with unit weights. And they're going to make predictions. And as the uh, experts are incorrect, their weight is downweighted. OK? And um, each step in the algorithm is just going to choose the weighted majority as the namesake implies. So the first day, you know, we have weight three saying that it's going to be sunny and weight one that's saying it's going to be rainy. So we choose weight three and we're going to say it's uh, going to be sunny and it is actually sunny. So we're going to downweight the expert that that was going to be rainy, right? So this is pretty natural. We're just downweighting by half. And uh, half here is just for the illustration of the slides to be more general um, as on some fixed parameter, I suppose. Okay, so the next day we have various predictions and we have two and a half votes for rainy and one half, uh, sorry, one vote for sunny. So we're going to think it's going to be rainy and we're right. And so we're going to downweight the person that thinks it's going to be sunny. Okay, on day three, we now have two and a half votes for sunny, one for rainy and so forth, sorry, half for rainy and so forth. And in this case, you know, we're going to downweight all the experts that are incorrect. So we're going to downweight all three experts that that was sunny. Okay, and this goes on and so forth. So what's known about the weighted majority algorithm? Well, uh, this is a deterministic algorithm and it's known that the number of mistakes made by this uh, weighted majority is less than, um, is at most 2.41 times M where M is the number of mistakes made by the best expert. There's also an additive log factor here, but uh, we'll focus on the 2.41 for now. Um, this is actually bad because it multiplies um, the number of mistakes by the best expert, whereas we're kind of looking for an additive guarantee for uh, regret. But uh, it's a nice starting point. And actually, you know, the, the analysis is like so simple and beautiful that I can't resist uh, actually going over here because it's, you know, it's, it's two lines. So the analysis is just that the sum of the weights is going to be uh, downweighted by at least a factor of one fourth in each stage, right? Because we're choosing the majority. So if the majority is wrong, we're going to downweight that by half. Now the majority has at least half of the weight. So in each stage we're wrong, we're just going to decrease the total weight by one fourth at least. 
And so uh, the sum of the weights is at most three fourths times the number of, sorry, raise the number of mistakes that we made. And then n is the, uh, you know, the, the, the sum of the initial weights. Okay. But on the other hand, you know, the best expert is going to be decreased by a value of one half each time it's wrong. And so if the best expert makes big n mistakes, you know, after uh, the algorithm ends, its total weight will be uh, one half raised to the m, and the sum of the weights is certainly going to be an upper bound on the uh, weight of the best expert. So we have this inequality, you know, then solving for a little m on both sides gives us this uh, expression at the bottom, and it turns out this expression right here is actually just the 2.41. Okay, so, so that's it. It's a super elegant algorithm, but uh, it's not quite what we need just because it gives a multiplicative guarantee. So, I mean, you know, we've studied this for a while and we know that determinism is probably not the right way to go. So the natural thing to do is think about randomized algorithms. And um, the randomized weight majority is actually a lot better. It gives a one plus epsilon approximation and epsilon is some parameter here. So it doesn't have to be constant. Um, it's also known as uh, multiplicative weights. Um, but the, 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 I guess the, the bad side about this algorithm is that uh, it's an expectation, not, uh, you know, it's not, for sure. But uh, let's suppose that's good enough for now. Okay. So randomized weighted majority is just um, where we have these weights on each of the experts and we use these weights as probability measures. So um, we're just going to listen to an expert with probability proportional to its weight. Okay. Okay. So in summary, we have this weighted majority algorithm by Lillstone Wormuth. It uh, downweights each expert that is incorrect on each day and selects the weighted majority, but the uh, total number of mistakes is uh, proportional to M. On the other hand, randomized weighted majority follows each expert randomly with probability proportional to the weight of the expert and achieves regret um, roughly log in, root log n over T. Okay, and this is actually pretty optimal. Um, you, you can't do better than uh, root log N over T. So, so this is a great algorithm. Yeah. Um, so I'm actually not, uh, yeah, I don't actually know the answer to that. Um, yeah, that's a great question. I, I don't have an answer to that. Um, um, this is actually an issue in our analysis. We use weighted majority some places um, and we get expectation bounds. So, uh, I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, it, it is an issue. So, so that's a great question. Uh, I don't know, but I'll take a look at that. Thanks. Actually, I don't know if uh, anyone else here would know the answer to that question since it's, uh, it's uh, yeah. Why is it optimal to downweight each expert by one half? Because it's the only way to get Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. So, um, right. Uh, so, it's not necessarily optimal. In fact, for weight and majority, what they do is they downweight each expert by one minus epsilon instead of 50%. And epsilon is this uh, two minute parameter for the additive multiplicative guarantee. Yeah. Okay. So the upshot of all these uh, previous work is that they do require linear space to actually store all the weights and uh, all the, I guess, the, the, the running progress of each of the experts so far, right? So all these algorithms, they say, they keep track of um, how well each of the experts have been doing so far to understand what is the best expert that we should be listening to. Okay, so N here, you know, I, I guess this is the question that was asked earlier, uh, could actually be very large. And what if we don't want to store all the experts? You know, what if we want some linear space? So on one extreme, we can actually just use no memory and just randomly guess each day. And this is actually going to be good if the best expert makes a lot of mistakes, but you know, if the best expert makes uh, very few mistakes, it's not going to have good regret, right? So our question is, what are the space accuracy trade-offs for the online learning with um, experts problem? Okay, so um, yeah, I guess this is the, the point of the, the talk where I should probably formalize this uh, string model. And this is what Vaidehi calls the Jason Bourne model of computation. So um, in this model, an algorithm will wake up with no memory. It's going to have a note from its past self, which corresponds to uh, a state of the algorithm that uses at most a space. All right, so um, 
it's going to see the experts expert prediction predictions for today using this past note and it'll make a prediction um, for today. I'll see the outcome and then it'll write a note for itself for the next day. It'll go to sleep and forget everything and then it'll repeat and uh, go on from there. Okay. Okay, so um, you know, the summary is that uh, the state of the algorithm will be represented by a complete sequence of T days. And each day is kind of like an ordered pair where you have one prediction and one outcome. And we'll look at two models. In particular, we'll talk about an arbitrary order model where an adversary chooses the predictions and outcomes to trick you. But I should mention that there are models where the adversary actually looks at uh, either the internal state of the algorithm or just um, uh, the, pre the actual predictions itself. Uh, so we're not going to con be considering either of those models. We're just going to say that the order is arbitrary, but the actual outcome of the adversary or the actual outcome is independent of um, the internal states of the algorithm and your choice. Okay, so there's like no kind of feedback loop between the experts and the, uh, the outcome. Okay, so more generally, we'll have a random order model where an adversary would choose the experts, sorry, choose the predictions and outcomes to trick you, but then the, the order can be randomly shuffled. So, you know, if this was uh, one possible outcome of, uh, sorry, illustration of outcomes, then a random order could just shuffle these days and get the, a different uh, set of uh, outcomes. Okay, but we should note that like when the outcomes are shuffled, so are the corresponding um, expert predictions. Okay, so before we get into the nitty gritty of our results, uh, just a natural question, what if we just identify the best expert and follow this? Right, this seems like a pretty natural thing to do. We can just find the best expert so far, follow until we find a new best expert, follow that new best expert until you know some other best expert emerges and just repeat over and over again. Right, this seems like a super natural thing to do, but it turns out this is actually has to use linear space, and this is pretty simple. We can think about it in terms of a um, a communication reduction problem. So we'll look at the set disjointness communication protocol. So in this problem. We have two parties, Alice and Bob, and they each have sets X and Y that are, you can think of them as binary vectors from zero to one, uh, zero one in, uh, sorry, n-dimensional binary vectors, or you can also think of them as just sets from uh, zero through N, sorry, one through N. Okay, so the promise is that the, the two sets are either disjoint or they have one element in their intersection. Okay, and this actually requires tonal communication roughly uh, omega n. So you, you pretty much can't do better than sending each element from Alice to Bob. Okay, so the reduction is pretty straightforward. Suppose there exists an algorithm that identifies the best expert. Then I'll also create a stream so that each element of x is an expert that is corrected on its own day. So let's suppose that x, you know, the vector that Alice receives is uh, the following binary vector. And this can be associated with a corresponding vector that's just the uh, first four triangular numbers because uh, that's the positions where there are ones in this binary vector. Okay, so she's going, so Alice is going to make a stream that um, on day one has expert one correct on the first day and only expert one correct on the first day. Then expert three is going to be the only expert that's right on the second day. Expert six is going to be the only expert that's right on the third day and so forth. So then Alice is going to take the algorithm, run it on the stream that they create induced by their set X, and they're going to pass the state of their algorithm to Bob. And then Bob is going to continue running this algorithm on a stream S prime that they create in a similar manner using their set Y. So at the end, um, the algorithm will output an, an expert I, which is some position in N, and then Alice and Bob will check whether the intersection of uh, their two sets is I or not. So this is actually a multi-round code protocol, but um, set this shortness uses um, and total communication, so this is okay. Okay, so this doesn't quite solve set to shortness because there's some complexities, like maybe the algorithm um, will ignore what Alice and Bob actually tell it to do, or the experts, and just uh, do something else. But uh, I guess this can be formally flushed out. Okay, so if you kind of believe me that this solves set to shortness, then it follows that this algorithm has to use linear space. So all I'm saying is that any algorithm that identifies the best expert has to use linear space. So the strategy we mentioned above will, will not work. Yeah, Anesh. Yeah, okay. 
Oh, so Bob will just send I star back to I, uh, Alice. Oh, why is that? <clears throat> um, Bob will send I star and Alice will send X, X of I star. This is that bit going to be Right. Right. So uh, if it's I, the identity of the unique element is in the text. Yeah, so you know, it, it there could be an intersection, but it's not clear what the intersection could be. So this algorithm is a way to reduce the number of possible intersections down to just one element, and then Bob can send that candidate to Alice, and then they can confirm whether or not um, there's an intersection there or not. Yeah. Yeah, and actually that's great intuition. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this seems bad, but it's not the end of the story because low regret algorithms do not need to find the best expert, right? In your example that you gave, we don't need to find the best expert. We just need to listen to one of these approximately best experts. Okay, so our first result is actually another pessimistic message that says uh, under certain regret bounds, um, any algorithm that achieves a certain regret, delta, with probably at least three fourths, has to use a certain amount of space. This is n over delta squared t space. And the lower bound actually holds for arbitrary order, random order, and I didn't actually define the IID stream, but uh, it also holds for that as well. Okay, and to give some intuition here, um, n is the number of experts, right? So this bound is saying that as the number of experts grows, your space needs to grow. Delta is your average regret, so it's some parameter that's less than one, and also it represents like accuracy. So as delta gets closer to zero, you're going to be more accurate, but your algorithm also needs to use more space. And finally, t is the number of days that you have. And this algorithm is actually saying that if you have more days, you can kind of afford to be less accurate at first, and um, you can actually use less space. Okay, so more days actually means the algorithm is easier and you can use less space. Okay, so that's a lower bound, but uh, we want some optimistic message. So we also have an algorithm that achieves um, delta regret in the random order model, and it uses space n over delta squared t up to some log factor. So this is tight with the previous bound. And it's actually nice also because delta here is um, like, it, the, the valid parameters that we can use this algorithm for, for with delta is um, down to like a root log n over t. And this is kind of the optimal regret that we're getting from multiplicative weights in the uh, offline model uh, up to some constants. No, it's actually greater than. Um, when the regret gets like too small, like if we want to be super accurate, then we can't actually achieve it. So as long as our desired regret is above a certain parameter, then we can achieve this. But uh, of course, like the more interesting values are when delta gets smaller. And so, you know, this actually holds um, at this value. And so that's saying that our regret can almost match the optimal off, um, algorithm when, when you're not constrained by space. Yeah. So if I said delta to be smaller than that, yeah. then you can say, you know, n over delta squared t or omega n, so I could just uh, uh, keep all the information. Yeah, that's true. Um, that, that, that's true. Yeah, I guess I should say that uh, our algorithm only works for this case, but, uh, but uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, and actually that's a good point. Like um, uh, the lower bound actually does say that, you know, if we want to go beyond a certain amount, um, uh, it, it does show a separation between um, a between the offline model and, sorry, between the space constrained model and the and, uh, unconstrained space model, right? Like if you don't have linear space, then you can't achieve certain um, regret that you would be able to if you had access to all the, the experts. Okay, so that's our result for the random order model, but uh, you know, life may not be so pleasant and we may not have a random order model, so we could have an arbitrary order model. And we actually have some surprising results here. So we actually get that there exists an algorithm that uses space n over delta t here. And this is surprising because it beats the lower bound that we had in two slides ago. Um, 
But there's no contradiction because we do need to assume that the total number of mistakes needs to be small. But sorry, the total number of mistakes by the best expert. All right, and I think uh, you know what was previously observed was that um, uh, in in the lower bound that we gave for set disjointness, the issue was that uh, you have two of these experts that are really close to each other, but actually the intuition is that you know not only is it we have that two of these experts are close to each other, but they also all make a lot of mistakes. Okay, so if we if the best expert makes a very small number of mistakes, it's still okay. We can still identify it. Um, and so this is kind of what the, uh, the this result is saying. Okay, and um, the algorithm is oblivious to the number of mistakes made by the, the best expert. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so a lot is just saying that if M is bigger than this amount, then our uh, upper bound doesn't hold. So if the best expert makes you know, more than a delta squared fraction of uh, mistakes, then our algorithm will not work. And, and this needs to happen because otherwise we, we you know, contradict like the lower bound from a few slides ago. Um, so it's definitely not sharp in terms of the constant. Uh, uh, it's probably not sharp in terms of the log squared, but uh, yeah, it's probably not sharp in terms of log squared either. Um, but uh, but yeah, like you know. Um, I think it is tight. Okay, for our algorithm, it is tight for delta squared t, but it's not clear whether that's actually tight or not. And yeah, I think that's actually like one of the future directions I think is pretty interesting. Okay, so um, I guess this is where I want to pause and ask for questions, but uh, we just had a round of questions. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, okay, so like when I thought about this model, it seems like like in a lot of applications you might like not know capital T, right? Yeah. It seems like knowing capital T as big as helpful. So do you have results? still work like if you're just told at time t or later i'll stop you um no it will they will not work um we, we do need time t in terms of uh our actual output or sorry our actual algorithm uh that is a huge weakness of our algorithm and um i think that's a great um interesting area to look at i actually didn't even think about this until i was practicing this talk and you know someone mentioned that uh well you kind of need t here so Yeah, it's because um, you have space bounds. So you can use double tricks to get your accuracy, but you know, your space will be, will you will use too much just from the first phase alone. Yeah. Oh, kind of. So, yeah. you know, the doubling trick only depends on when you start. You, 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 you can forget everything that you start after you see double. Um, I think you can do that, but I guess the issue is uh, if you don't know when t is going to be, then uh, well, how, how do you initiate your, your algorithm in the first so place? T, t plus, and you know, I see you more than one day, so then I think right. okay, clearly make a mistake. I know t equals two, t yeah. is four, eight, one, four. Yeah, but I guess the challenge is that um, if we start with t equals one or eight, then you know our algorithm at least will have already committed to using a certain number of space, amount of space. Um, so, oh, see. yeah, see. so it's because you know the, the space you live is getting going down, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, no, I mean, that's that's a, a very natural question to ask, and so I, I don't know the answer to that. Although, I will say that there is a lower bound, it, the t appears in the lower bound, so I don't know, maybe. Maybe it's uh, needed in some some regards. Thank you. Yeah. One more. Yeah. So, like a lot of these regret bombs, are you showing like regret at any point in time, or are you showing regret only at time t? Oh, um, it's actually regret at time t. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't know how to change it to the other part because I think it would be the same challenge. Okay, so um, yeah, I guess we'll start moving to the technical parts of the talk. So I guess I'll talk about the lower bound first. So our first lower bound, just as a uh, recollection, it's that any algorithm that achieves a certain um, average regret with probably three fourths must use at least n over delta squared t space. So delta here is the average regret. T is the number of days and is the number of experts. Okay, and the strategy will be kind of similar to what I mentioned for the set distance problem. We'll consider what we call the distributed detection problem. In this case, t players each hold n bits and have to distinguish between the two cases. So in one case, every index for every player is drawn IID from a fair coin. So we just flip a coin and zero with probability half, one with probability half. And in the second case, we have one index that's selected arbitrarily and um, all the bits of each player for that particular index is going to be biased with uh, you know, um, parameter half plus epsilon while the other ones are fair coins. So maybe this is better represented with a picture. So in the no case, we have um, a number of players and um, all their bits are going to be fair coin tosses. But in the other case, we have um, one specific index so that uh, all the coins are by all the, the coin tosses for that particular index are biased. So let's suppose that you know the second index for each of the players is more likely to be heads in, in this case. Okay, so our goal is to distinguish between these two um, inputs using as small communication as possible. Oh, sorry, and there are key players here. So, so um, these players can talk to each other in terms of they can share each other's bits, they can write on a whiteboard, whatever. Okay. Yeah. What, one round and what's one uh, plate? Uh, the horizontal thing, one round? Uh... Oh, so each of the players hold the coin tosses. So this player holds uh, coin tosses, uh, five coin tosses. Okay. This player holds five coin tosses okay. and so forth. Um, so they want to distinguish whether one of their coins are biased or not. Right. So it's not like one player's coin is biased, you're saying <clears throat> in some round, everybody's coin. Yep. Yeah. And this is kind of what makes the problem hard because um, this player can kind of optimize a protocol to to determine whether this coin is biased, but uh, you know any of these coins can be biased, so they essentially need to do the same protocol for uh, all n coins. Okay. So I guess that segues nicely into the protocol, which is that um, uh, each player can send all their bits, but we only need to see a small number of random players, okay? So one protocol for solving this problem is that we can sample a number of players and we have the player send all of their coin tosses. And now if we have a specific coin, we can see just from one of our epsilon squared samples, whether that coin is biased or not. Okay, so this protocol is going to use one of our epsilon squared players and um, they're gonna send all their coin tosses. So that's N over epsilon squared total communication. So that's communication of the protocol and it's actually pretty straightforward to show that this is necessary as well. Um, the idea is kind of like what Anupam said, um, one over epsilon squared samples are necessary to distinguish between a fair coin and a biased coin with, uh, sorry, a coin with biased epsilon. But the intuition is that the players must solve the single coin problem on each of the end coins because they don't know which coin it's going to be. Okay, so formally the coins are all independent in the no distribution, independence applies, this information is additive. Uh, information for one coin requires one over epsilon, sorry, one coin protocol requires one over epsilon squared information. Multiply that by n, so you get your lower bound. Okay, so in summary, you know, we have this distributed detection problem and n over epsilon squared communication is necessary to solve this problem. Okay, so now we need to translate this into a lower bound for the experts problem. And the way we should think about it is that each player in the uh, coin problem refers to a different day and each bit 
in the quant problem refers to a different expert. And this is probably kind of counterintuitive to the way I set up because um, we have a bunch of players, like actual people in the coin problem, but they're not going to correspond to people in the experts problem. They're going to correspond to days. Okay. So, um, yeah. So um, each of the coin tosses will be, each of the coins will be experts, and they'll have a bunch of coin tosses which will correspond to different days. So I would like to say that if there exists a coin that is biased, that means that there's an expert that does better than all the other experts. And that means we should have smaller regret. So that's what I'd like to do in the reduction, but it's not quite formal because we could have like a very stubborn algorithm that just ignores all the experts, outputs some random gibberish that happens to be right. Right, so in this case, you know, me being stubborn, I might list, ignore all the experts and just think that's going to be sunny every day. And maybe it's the summer, so you know it just happens to be summer uh, sunny every day. All right, so this reduction will not work here. So yeah, an algorithm with bad guarantees can luckily still have good cost. And the way we get around this is use a masking argument that just says that for each day, the outcome and all the experts are each masked with an independent coin toss. And this kind of removes any um, I guess determinism that I could have with uh, with being a stubborn algorithm. So more formally, you know, the issue with our reduction on the left is that uh, we have a random algorithm that's that's just deterministic and it happens to be right. But if we add some kind of randomness into the actual outcomes, then um, well, our out actual out sorry our outputs will no longer be um, will no longer be uh, deterministic. Sorry. Our outputs here will not, will not be uh, easily fixed, but the experts here will still correspond to um, the actual outcomes. So notice that like, you know, on the first day we flip a random coin, it's one, so we flip all the um, expert advice. We also flip the actual outcome, but we don't flip the outcome of uh, whatever the deterministic outcome would be, okay? So this is a nice way of just adding some randomness to get rid of deterministic algorithms that uh, could be luckily correct. And from there on, it's just a concentration bound. It's just saying that um, if there is no biased coin, then no expert will have higher regret. Um, or sorry, no expert will do better than one half plus delta over two, so we actually will have higher regret. Um, and if there is a biased coin, then there is some expert that does well, so we will have lower regret. Okay, so the summary again is that if we have regret delta, then we'll be able to solve this coin toss problem for epsilon equal is roughly delta using n over delta squared total communication. Now we have key players. So, you know, if we have n over delta squared total communication, then one player has to use um, n over delta squared t communication, which translates to the space bound that we were, we're promising. Okay, so that was the lower bound. Um, I'll start talking about the upper bounds now, but I just uh, you know want to check see if there are any questions for the lower bound. Okay, cool. Yeah, so um, to get started for the upper bounds, we'll first consider arbitrary order models, and we'll think about the low mis mistake regimes. So in this case, we have that the best expert M. Sorry, the best expert makes a number of mistakes m that's smaller than delta squared t. And this is actually pretty small of a number of mistakes compared to what we want in our regret, because we want regret like delta, which is um, additive error delta t. So the number, our additive error is actually like a one over delta fraction much bigger than the number of mistakes made by the best expert. And so this is kind of keying into why we can use, we can get away with much less space when the best expert has a small number of mistakes. So just yeah. Phrasing this as a regret bound, we can also, we could just phrase it as, if there's a really good expert, then in absolute terms, we'll do it. Yeah, yeah. And this is actually with a high probability, not, oh, okay, so it says probably four fifths, but it can be made to high probability. 
Um, in contrast, our random order algorithms will, will be uh, expectation balanced because we use uh, multiplicative weights. But uh, but here, yeah, it's so we can get high probability. Yeah. No, it's just um, we'll have more. Um, oh, okay, so I, I guess um, uh, spoiler here is that uh, we're, we're our algorithm will be sampling a bunch of experts in different rounds, and so if we just take more experts, then we're likely to sample the best expert. Yeah, so um, we know that there's a really ex accurate expert. So what if we iteratively pick pools of experts and delete them if the pool runs poorly? Okay, so let's suppose that we pick pools of size two, and for our first day, we pick the first two experts into our pool. Then we see that after two days, both of them have made a mistake. And let's suppose that the best expert we know makes no mistakes. Then we know that like, none, none of these can be the best expert. So we can afford to throw them away. Then we look at the next two experts. We put them in the pool and we see that after two more days, both of them have made a mistake. And so if the best expert makes no mistakes, we know that uh, neither of them can be the best expert and we'll move on to the next pool of size two. Okay, so this is a pretty straightforward algorithm, but it actually works if there are no number of mistakes. So in the no mistake regime, um, we can show that each pool will have at most log K errors if we take the majority vote of the pool, because uh, you know, each time we can make, make an error, at least half of the pool will be, um, will be incorrect, so half the pool will be thrown away, so we can make mistakes on log K days. Um, so if the best expert makes no mistakes, and each pool samples uh, picks K experts, then we only need N over K iterations, right? Like after N over K iterations, we've gone through all the experts, so we'll certainly have seen the best expert. On the other hand, we want to achieve regret delta T. And so setting these to be equal, we get that the K should be roughly size N over delta T. Um, and that's the bound that we initially promised in our algorithm, so, so we would be done. Okay. So the summary in the no mistake regime is this that we iteratively pick pools of small experts. And we output the majority vote of the experts while deleting any incorrect expert. And what makes this work is that uh, if the number of rounds is small, then the pools must have done well, so the overall regret is, is small. Like maybe you didn't sample the best expert, but uh, your very first expert was just wrong once and it was at the very end. So you stick with that pool until like the very end. So even though you didn't get the best expert, your total regret is small here. On the other hand, the total number of rounds cannot be large because at some point the best expert would have been sampled and then it would have been retained. So these are two of the, the key properties that uh, we use for this no mistake regime and properties that we would kind of want to emulate for uh, the rest of our algorithms. Okay. So now we'll consider a low mistake regime again. So the best expert is allowed to make more than, you know, more than one mistake. But if the best expert makes M mistakes, then we need to use N times M over K pools to achieve the regret delta T because uh, we, could we could remove the best expert um, up to M times when we sample it, right? Like we pick the best expert, we see that it's made a mistake, we are confused whether it's a good expert or not, we throw it away. And we repeat over and over again until uh, the best expert no longer makes any mistakes. But at that point, we've used a lot of pools. Yeah. Um, yeah, you could do that. Um, I guess right now we're just saying that. Um, we delete it when it makes any mistake, but but you're right. Like uh, we could also throw it out when it makes m mistakes. Yeah, and, but I guess the issue here is that m would have to be known, uh, which is something that we don't want to, uh, for our algorithm. We want to be oblivious to m. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's another question. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So we don't want m to be known here. Okay, so we have two fixits for this issue. Um, where we sample too many pools. So the first fix it is that we can randomly sample pools instead of iteratively picking pools. And maybe this will happen to avoid the days in which the best expert makes mistakes. So it's, it's no longer deterministic. So maybe you can use that to your advantage and um, again, avoid 
um, having n m over k resamplings because somehow you've avoided uh, the best expert when it has made mistakes. Um, the issue here is a more of an analytical issue rather than an algorithmic issue, which is just saying that uh, if we want to kind of use our two properties that we discussed earlier to prove our correctness, we can't actually show the first property, which is that the best expert will be retained. Right? If you're sampling things, you can still sample the best expert and throw it away later. So it doesn't quite match the, the framework that, uh, that the outline of the proof that we discussed. So are you buying sampling a new set of experts every time? Yeah. Oh, sorry, uh, maybe that wasn't clear. I guess what I'm saying is that instead of picking the next K items, uh, experts in your pool, you just sample a, a random set of K experts. So then, so oh, because um, you could still sample the best expert at some point and it'll make a mistake. And um, you know, if we're using the same algorithm that we said before, where we throw away an expert whenever it makes a mistake, then um, it won't be retained anymore. Yeah. 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 Or if uh, all the experts in the pool make a mistake. So then yeah. you want the best expert to take the most M, M plus one kind of expert. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we want to avoid that because um, that would mean a too large number of resamplings, but uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So this algorithm I mentioned won't actually uh will need to be adjusted. Uh, so we'll, we'll actually pick um. So our space size, which we have of like a n over a delta t, is actually just the number of experts we have in the pool. Um, and I guess one intuition is that delta t here is going to be again much bigger than m, so it still serves as like an upper bound on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Wait, make um, okay, so this is an incorrect algorithm because it will give uh, too many resamplings, but. Um, yeah, the algorithm here is just that we pick pools of size n over delta t. Um, and whenever all the experts in the pools have made mistakes, then we completely delete the pool. We're actually doing this in an iterative procedure. So like whenever an expert in the pool makes a mistake, we just delete the expert. Does the one again? Yeah, so I mean, if you sample n m over k pool, like if you go through this process a large number of times, then like the budget of mistakes that the best expert can make is kind of gone, right? Like they will have made m mistakes and then they can't make any more mistakes. So once you sample it again, it will always be right. Just clarify, yeah. so then I think the confusion here is every expert will be included in m or m plus one pools. So you're going to go around the whole list. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so you know, you you have your first pool of k experts, your next pool, so forth, and then once you reach the end, you you start over again. Um, not in this case, right? Because it's going to be zero until it makes a mistake, and then we just uh, delete it from the pool. Um, more generally, when we talk about some more sophisticated algorithms, uh, we will, yeah. Okay, um, I'm a bit short on time, so um, I won't talk about some of the fixits. Uh, there's, um, yes, I guess some bad things can happen, but it's actually kind of surprising. So the, the, the thing that you want to do here is not delete a, an expert immediately. You want to say that you only delete an expert once it's made uh, a small, a, a large fraction of mistakes. Okay, so um, if we, we delete experts that have made, a, like the, the, the accuracy needs to be um, lower than one minus delta over log n, accuracy is still sampled. And um, that, that's the threshold at which we'll start deleting experts. Okay, so we still want to show that if the number of rounds is small, the, the pools must have done well, and that uh, the number of rounds cannot be large. So um, we have a structural lemma that says that uh, if 
um, a pool is used for a certain number of days, then we can upbound the total mistakes it makes. Uh, I think that's pretty intuitive, right? Like if the pool is around for a long time, it can't make a lot of mistakes. On the other hand, now we want to show that um, we can't have too many resamplings. And this is actually pretty intuitive because now we're deleting some experts when uh, they've, when the fraction of uh, mistakes they've made is at most uh, one minus, oh, sorry, it's uh, one over, it's, it's uh, one over delta. Uh, there's some log factors, but it's roughly one over delta. So, yeah. Wait, doesn't storing the subset of experts that have been deleted take like n space? Um, so in the previous example, it, it doesn't because we just uh, look at the next, it, it's like a consecutive set of K experts. So we just look at the, X, the index. So like, well, like you try to, you then skip over the ones that have been deleted. So once everybody can do it, you, you start and you get the first K, next K, next K, and then when you get the last K, you come back to the next K. We're only remembering such information within the system. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, I see the okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, now we are sampling K experts at a time, but uh, you can just keep track of the indices that you sampled. And uh, it doesn't need to be sampling without replacement. Like you can afford to sample the same experts over and over again. Yeah. Okay. But the point here now is that um, we're only keeping experts um, if they haven't erred more than a certain fraction. So now, um, you can actually show that the best expert will be retained as long as you sample kind of early enough before it makes a mistake. Okay, so now you have the concept of bad days, which is days on which the best expert is deleted by the pool if it's sampled on that day. Because if you sample any earlier, its accuracy is going to be too high and you will not delete it. And this is a fix to the earlier problem where we said that uh, the best expert could always be deleted, right? We could have sampled it really early, but then at some point we'll make a mistake and we'll delete it. But we're saying that can't happen anymore if we have this uh, more lenient uh, threshold of deletion. So this is for random shuffle order? This is for arbitrary order, yeah. Yeah, but uh, it's okay because we can, even though it's in the arbitrary order, we can bound the number of bad days. And um, this will show that, uh, yeah, so, so uh, and we'll have a much larger number of resamplings than the number of bad days. And then we show that we have to sample the best expert on some good day, then we'll keep it uh, around forever. Okay. Yeah, so um, I guess the takeaway is that we sample these pools and we can show that if the number of rounds is small, the pools must have done well, so the overall regret is small. And um, the number of rounds actually cannot be large because at some point the best expert would have been sampled and retained. This is uh, this good day, bad day property. Okay. So I'm really running out of time now, but the, the point from, I guess the main takeaway message or the intuition take from the previous algorithm is that we kind of use majority vote to look at the remaining experts in each sampled pool. But of course, instead of removing experts, we could have just downweighted them and run deterministic weighted majority. But then we could have also just run a randomized weighted majority and run these experts like multiplicative weights or um, follow the perturbed leader, like these sequential prediction algorithms. So this is actually, a good meta algorithm for random order streams, which is that you just sample pools, you run some kind of uh, sequential prediction algorithm on these pools, and then you resample if the expected cost of the pool is bad. And you can actually compute the expected cost of the pool explicitly because you actually see all the predictions of uh, the experts and the actual outcomes. Okay. So this is something we didn't think about for a long time. Like we tried very sophisticated versions of majority and like, uh, you know, elimination. But at the end, uh, yeah, we realized this connection and um, maybe it's, you know, something that um, would have been obvious if we started with a different perspective. Okay, so yeah, multiplic uh, multiplicative weights works here. We also can show that um, follow the perturbed leader here works. Uh, I guess one interesting question is what other sequential algorithms will work, but it's basically anything that has this trade-off where we have a one plus epsilon multiplicative um, total number of mistakes. Okay, so I realize that a lot of this is gibberish, like it doesn't make sense because the context is not there, but the point is that the number of mistakes by the algorithm in expectation is just roughly one plus epsilon times the number of mistakes by the best expert. Okay, so... Um, yeah, I guess a summary of our results is just that we have a lower bound that says that 
any algorithm needs n over delta squared t space. We have an algorithm in the random order model that matches this, an algorithm that actually beats this in the adversarial model, assuming that the uh, number of mistakes is small. Okay, and it can extend to general costs, general regret, and uh, other models as well. So um, yeah, so some some natural questions that uh, would follow would be, um, what can we get for the arbitrary order streams when the best expert incurs unrestricted costs? Because uh, you know, it was pointed out earlier, the best expert has to make like delta squared times t mistakes, right? So even if delta here is a constant, can we tolerate a, a, a constant fraction of mistakes? Uh, more generally, this is a very specific problem in online convex optimization. So of course it makes sense to think about when the predictions are real values and evaluate against the correct answer with respect to some overall loss function, right? Like I know CJ has done a lot of work in that. So uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, this is a great open uh, area to look at. Um, we can also think about extra constraints imposed on the experts. For example, you know, maybe you're only allowed to make a certain number of uh, predictions for a certain outcome over a certain amount of time, but the experts somehow violate these constraints. So you, you still need to get around uh, some of these constraints that the experts don't listen to. Okay, and uh, yeah, that's all I have. So thanks for coming to this talk and thanks for listening and uh, being involved in asking questions. It seems like the case for one would you know, care about algorithms like this is where experts are sort of implicitly defined functions of some like underlying constraints. So that's one case for one. So you're and saying experts are some function of underlying experts. So imagine we have like, you know, some small number of like real experts. Okay. And we want to do as well as, say, the best majority of any subset. Or some like really big family of implicitly defined experts like that. Yeah. So those, there's an exponential number in that case, and I guess like can't prove anything about exponential number of arbitrary adversaries. But is there hope when there are these like more nicely defined implicit functions? So I guess I'm a little confused why it's arbitrary number exponential number of uh, arbitrary adversaries instead of experts. So if they're adversarially defined. Exponentially many experts. Oh, you can't prove anything because they could all be uh, just they could all be completely distinct. There's no way to prove it. But like, you do anything with exponential experts if they have one exponential. Experts. So I guess the main issue with what you're suggesting for the first part is that if your number of experts is exponential, you know, it's two to the T, so N is, yeah, so that's not going to work. Um, if you have some structure to them, maybe if you know some kind of like envelope on these uh, experts, then you can kind of, um, I guess you can say like, you know, maybe this set of experts is kind of uh, upper bounded by uh, this expert and this one is like lower bounded by another one and you can use those as proxies. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess uh, speaking at a, uh, like a, a high level, I'm not, I'm not sure um, what you can say about an exponential number of experts without like an additional number of assumptions. Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, Alec. Wait, for all of your four algorithms, is it true that once any expert individual makes one mistake, you can make it? No, no, because uh, in our later algorithms, we're saying that if it's made only a certain fraction of errors, like it's let's say it's been around for um, U days, if it's made at least U over delta um, errors, uh, sorry, that's, U I guess like, yeah, <laughs> U delta um, um, errors, then you delete it. Okay, here you can keep track of zero errors because you only have like C in the grade. Yes, yes, yeah, you only have K uh, experts, you can keep track of how many errors they made. They don't actually, we just randomly sample. So we sample K experts. Then if this is a bad pool, we just randomly sample another group of K experts and it could be exactly the same. That's uh, okay. I mean, well,
Yeah, yeah. It's important that we randomly sample overall. That way, we actually can get the best expert. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. In the no mistake thing, once you encounter a pool with the best expert, you just keep the pool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so if we didn't uh, change the threshold, like if we just randomly sample without changing the threshold, um, we would still delete the best expert if we sampled it because, uh, you know, we throw away anything that makes a mistake. So we kind of need those, these two ideas in tandem. Um, until it's labeled bad, right? Until like all the pools are, okay. So uh, until the pool is thrown away, whether that means, yeah. Yeah, because it's majority vote, right? So like if all the experts in the pool are bad except for one, but that one survives for a very long time, that means that expert's doing well. So we should just keep listening to it. Have you tried like uh, like implementing these? I don't know if there's like a good like forecasting data or something where you could be compared with like a um, only like only got the end space. Uh, okay, so the the answer is we we definitely have not tried implementing them, but uh, um, looking the other standard benchmarks for the right? learning with errors problem or expert predictions problem, right? Um. Yeah, I guess uh, I, I should probably dig around in the learning with experts literature more to, to find out about that. Yeah, but but we certainly haven't tried implementing any of this. Yeah. Yeah. One, if there's no number around, that's what we Yep. 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 Let's thank Samson again.